Welcome to the seminar Organizing in Times of Crisis, the case of COVID-19. And welcome in particular to the second class of this seminar, which is entitled Organizing in and for the Unexpected. My name is uh, Daniel Geiger. I'm professor for organization studies at the University of Hamburg. And I do research on crisis and crisis management for quite some time now. And uh, in that regard, we have studied organizations such as the German Agency for Technical Relief, THW, the Hamburg Firefighters, or most recently the Ugandan Red Cross, and their Ebola response organizations, which uh, show quite some interesting similarities to the current COVID-19 pandemic and the way uh, it is managed. So what can you expect from this second class? The guiding question of this class is how organizations can routinely deal with unexpected events. So how can organizations be prepared for unexpected events and how can they work through these unexpected events and master them successfully. In particular, you will learn about that crisis will unfold in different phases and each phase requires very distinct measures and management practices organizations need to entail in order to manage these crises effectively. When managing crisis and when dealing with unexpected events, organizations need to carefully balance the tension between, on the one hand, roll out stable and reliable procedures and routines in order to work through the crisis, and on the other hand, to flexibly respond to novel and unexpected events in order to cope with these events. And when looking at that tension, we will particularly focus on the role of routines, how they are managed and played out in managing unexpected events. We will look at the key role of improvisation, and we will look at the way people in these organizations quite often are required to switch roles swiftly in order to manage unexpected events in an effective way. And last but not least, we will look at the issue of rules and rule breaking um, for addressing unexpected events, since most bureaucratic organizations rely on a well rehearsed and well structured set of rules on the one hand to be able to effectively organize, and on the other hand, unexpected events quite often require members of these organizations to break with these rules which enables them to address unexpected occurrences. When we look at research on managing the unexpected and management of crisis, we can broadly delineate two different understandings or different paradigms in that regard. One is what I have labeled the traditional understanding which focuses on preventing crisis from happening. So the key idea of this traditional understanding is that unexpected events needed to be avoided at all costs. So organizations have to have the capability to plan very well, to obtain the necessary information from the environment, and to have very sophisticated forecasting systems that enable them to foresee the future in a meaningful way and because they have such a good understanding of how the future might unfold, unexpected events can and should be avoided. So the focus of these organizations is then internally to establish a well-trained set of reliable routines and procedures that allow them to carry out their operations in a effective and efficient way, and at the same time to engage in a very good environmental scanning 
which provides them with sufficient insights into how the environment might develop, how the future might look like to avoid being caught by unexpected events. And the idea is that in case unexpected events occur, it is basically the failure of planning. So it's attributed to bad planning um, and better planning could have avoided this unexpected events. However, in the recent years, a new paradigm has emerged, which um, is quite nicely circumscribed with the notion of expecting the unexpected. So the idea is that when we deal with grand challenges where we face complex problems that are uncertain and that they are evaluative in nature, the future can never be fully anticipated because the problems we are dealing with are complex and we do not know how they develop. So unexpected events still will inevitably occur. So the idea is that unexpected events can never be fully avoided because the environment in which organizations operate is complex and the organization itself is complex. This is sometimes um, circumscribed with a normal accident theory where the idea is because organizations are so complex, accidents which result from unexpected events can never be fully avoided. And when we look at that paradigm, the question needs to be reversed. The question is no longer what can we do to avoid the unexpected, but the question is rather how can we manage the unexpected if we know that unexpected events will inevitably occur. So the key point here is what to do to expect the unexpected. And when we look into literature of crisis and crisis management, it's very important to understand that crises unfold in different phases. These phases are, of course, more analytical distinctions um, because in practice, a crisis will not very easily be, can be delineated in different phases because it's sometimes very chaotic and unstructured. However, when we talk about managing crisis, it's very important that we differentiate between different phases of crisis management because each phase needs to be treated differently by organizations. If you look at the anticipation phase, that's the normal operation of the organization, and this organization gets hit, hit by an unexpected event, then the so-called chaos phase starts because you know, structures are not there um, the current mode of operation is disrupted. And this chaos phase requires that structures are rolled out very fast, that complexity is reduced to a significant degree, and that the whole management is aimed at slowing down the processes rather than acting hastily and fast. Once this chaos phase is overcome because sufficient response structures have been established, the so-called containment phase sets in. And this containment phase requires organizations to be able to act flexibly on the basis of what they know, of their learned routines, to be able to improvise, to switch roles of members, and also to be able to break rules to face unanticipated circumstances. And once this has been done, a so-called phase of the new normal comes in, which it means that simply means that the crisis mode is over and a new normal mode might be established. And in the following, I will focus particularly on the chaos and the containment phases, as they are the most interesting phases when it comes to managing unexpected events. What we know when we look at this uh, chaos phase is that it's of utmost importance in this chaos phase that organizations establish structures very fast. Because the unexpected events disrupts, disrupts existing structures, 
new structures need to be established and implemented um, by organizations in order to make this crisis manageable. And the organizations usually do that on the basis of routines. So they have pre-established structures that enable them to establish novel structures. And a good example of that is, for example, the triage routine, which is commonly uh, done in hospitals, for example, where patients are differentiated according to the priority in which they need treatment. Right? So those who need immediate treatment, those who need treatment but it's not um, life-threatening, and those who can wait longer for treatment because it's uh, not a severe issues they are dealing with. Yeah? And doctors in um, hospitals do that on the basis of uh, trained routines, so they perform this kind of triage to get a quick overview of what is happening. Secondly, it's very important in this phase that organizations engage in what we have labeled active overseeing, so that they ignore certain aspects in this chaos phase to not get overwhelmed too fast in these chaotic situations. An example we have from our study of the uh, German uh, THW, which act in uh, earthquake response operations, is that when they start acting or arrive at the earthquake setting, usually these responders are then approached by people and say, come over, help, please. The building over there has collapsed. Help us in uh, digging out people. Let us help, help us in finding victims. And in this phase, however, the um, THV usually says, no, we cannot help you at this stage. First, we have to get our own structures ready. And once this is done, we can start acting on help in actually performing our primary mission. So avoid getting destructive is a key competence um, in this chaos phase, which uh, why I have said non-acting is a key acting, key action. So at some point, it's important to refrain from acting fast and hastily. And this is done on the basis of in prior trained routines and procedures. Our, as one of the first responders of the THW has said, each catastrophe is different, but we always approach it in a similar way. So we always, in this first phase, do act upon our well-trained routines and we roll them out. So the key focus in this chaos phase is to keep routines on track, to be a, avoid getting distractive, distracted, and reduce complexity significantly in order to not get overwhelmed by the chaos which happens around the organization. Once this chaos phase is over, which means that some response structures have been established. For example, in case of the TRV, it means that a base of operation is established. Or in case of hospitals, a first triage is accomplished. Then the so-called containment phase can start, which requires a different set of skills and capabilities. In this containment phase, it's of utmost importance that organizations have the capability to act flexibly because no, an unexpected event happen, happened. Things cannot be proceeded as normal. So what these organizations then do is that they act flexibly on the basis of learned routines. So they break routines, which they already have, into discrete chunks and reassemble them and recombine them in novel ways in order to fit those routines to existing, to the situation the organization is currently facing. So for example, um, doctors break their normal patient treatment routines apart and start doing chunks of that routines, for example, ventilation, 
um, for example, triage, for example, other measures and reassemble them in novel ways. And this is closely linked to the idea of improvisation. So that means there is no protocol for managing this crisis. So crisis managers and first responders need to engage in what is sometimes called bricolage, so they need to use whatever tools are currently at hand that help them in overcoming that situation. So you need novel tools, you need things that are currently there to be able to act upon. And that requires a high degree or variety of skill sets of these first responders. And thirdly, what is also important in that regard, and this what research has shown, is that these first response organizations are very good in switching roles. So team members can swiftly and rapidly take on the roles of other members. For example, because someone is occupied, someone is him herself injured and cannot um, help in the response operation. Or um, certain tasks cannot be accomplished as it has been planned. So people might be occupied in, in a specific task and cannot be freed from it. So others have to be swiftly able to take over that task and um, jump in. And in order to operate in these containment phases or to roll out these distinct, or to have these capabilities, it's very important that members who work in these organizations have a very broadly shared knowledge base. So it's very much a generalist approach. So only because a very generalized knowledge enables members of organizations to stand in for each other to um, fast or swiftly switch roles. And this requires very intensive training. For example, the Hamburg firefighters they all receive the same training, irrespective of their particular role in that organization. And this ensures a broadly shared knowledge base, but on the other hand, it's obviously very costly for that organization to roll out that intensive training, but they know that this is very important, otherwise members cannot switch roles in an effective way. Secondly, um, when it comes to leading in these containment phases, it's very important that frontline managers or frontline staff who actually acts on the actual fighting of the crisis has the authority to make decisions because only those people working at the front line know what is going on and what needs to be done. So they need to be entitled to make decisions. Otherwise, decisions take too long it cannot be referred back to the hierarchy which is normally in place. So decisions need to be made where the problems actually occur and that requires what I have labeled here a very non-hierarchical form of coordination on the front line. So this is very unusual for most bureaucratic organizations who are used to coordinate in a hierarchical fashion. But in this containment phase, this a non-hierarchical way of coordination is key since decisions need to be made where the problem actually occurs. Just imagine a firefighter who is inside a building. He needs to be able to make decisions how to confront the fire, how to attack the situation and cannot wait and, uh, until his manager then instructs him how to do and what to do things. So, these decisions need to be made at the front line. And this leads us to a very interesting story about the way rules are treated in these containment phases. And on this slide, I have adapted a model from a paper written by Farah and Chao about um, fast response organizations. It's derived from a study of um, intensive care units in hospitals. And whilst I'm not going to run you through the entire model, 
interesting is now this for the, the case of this class is that this model depicts how patients are treated in an intensive care unit. So the idea is a patient arrives, then the so-called chaos phase sets in, structures are established, the triage happens, and then there are two phases how patients can develop. There's what the upper phase is the so-called habit habitual trajectory, so patients are treated the normal way, so no unexpected events occurs. Um, patients can be treated as it has been planned, as it has been anticipated. The opposite is the problematic trajectory, um, where patients develop in unanticipated ways, and this requires novel actions. And of particular importance is what they label here as protocol breaking. Protocol breaking means that doctors treating this kind of patients quite often in these situations need to break from established and well-documented ways of how to treat that patient in order to successfully treat that And this brings us to the role of rules in managing um, unexpected events. So rules are usually established or protocols now for, for managing the expected situations. However, in unexpected situations, rules commonly do not fit because they are made for a specific situation and this specific situation is not there if something unexpected occurs. So the rule is not fitting anymore. So one cannot just follow through that rule. So that requires that people acting in these situations are able to break these rules. And this raises a very important question for these organizations. Who is entitled to break the rules? Under what grounds is one entitled to break rules? When is rule breaking tolerated? If rule breaking occurs, how can we prevent that the rules which are there for good reasons are eroded, they, that they are not respected and followed up any longer. And this brings us to this very interesting case of what I have labeled here practical illegal behavior, which marks out that specific case that rule breaking leads actually to successful behavior. So people break rules and because they broke rules, the situation was successfully managed. But at the time this rule breaking occurs, its successfulness is at this stage obviously not certain. So when you break a rule, you do not know will it be lead to a success or not. And this makes rule breaking so difficult for those who actually need to engage in rule breaking behavior. So just to give you an example of this rule breaking, there's a real situation that happened at uh, the Hamburg port where um, they were offloading a cargo container ship, a large container vessel. In the middle of the night, it was very foggy and it was stormy. And one of the cranes had an issue and the, the, the chain which actually got stuck and because of the high wind speeds, the crane was about to fall um, on the ship and drop the container on the ship. So you can imagine uh, the devastating um, situation or the, what damages this could actually cause. And um, whilst this, this container was hanging in the air and the crane about um, to collapse, two harbor workers were climbing on that crane and actually used a chainsaw to cut off the chain so the container dropped on the cargo vessel and prevented this crane from collapsing. In doing so, they obviously broke each and every existing health and safety regulation that was um, existed on the Hamburg port, so it's never allowed to climb on those cranes, particularly not at night, particularly not in foggy circumstances, but they did so and pre thereby prevented 
greater harm. However, this caused a significant problem for the leadership of the Hamburg Port Authority because obviously these two harbor workers violated the health and safety rules. On the other hand, they prevented harm, but the management, of course, wanted also to preempt that in future these health and safety regulations are not followed through anymore. So that they had a very intensive discussion what to do with these two people. And they reached a very interesting conclusion. So they invited them to the management board. And the management board said, yeah, very many thanks uh, for your great uh, support and for your swift action. However, we do not want this to happen again. But in acknowledgement of your great action, we give you a voucher for our cafeteria worth five euros. So you can imagine a voucher for five euros is an acknowledgement on the one hand, but it's such a low acknowledgement that it will not incentivize others to follow through. You're not going to risk your life for a five euro um, coupon for the cafeteria. So it was a very smart way of dealing with rules and rule breaking in this sort of containment phase. So rule breaking is necessary, but it cannot be demanded. And if it is successful or not, is uncertain at the time rules are actually broken. So to summarize, what have we learned in this class? We have learned that for organizations, expecting the unexpected is a key capability. You cannot rely on your plans that the future unfolds in an anticipated way, but you need to be prepared for the unexpected. If the unexpected turns into a crisis, these crises unfold in different phases, and each phase requires very distinct approaches. The chaos phase needs to, for, or for the chaos phase, it's important that structures are implemented, that new structures are created, because existing structures have been disrupted. And in the chaos phase, or in the containment phase, a flexible enactment of existing structures is important. So structures need to be used, but in a flexible way. And this leads us to conclude that how can we learn to accept the unexpected? For organizations, it's more important to have structures that allow them to work through crisis rather than have more, the most sophisticated strategies which help them and for, for seeing all different ways how crisis might arrive, the most sophisticated response and preparedness plans will not help because each crisis will unfold in different ways. Unexpected events will inevitably occur. So in order to manage these crises, it's more important to have the appropriate amount, appropriate response structures rather than to have the most sophisticated response plans. Many thanks for your attention. I hope it was, gave you some interesting insights. And with the um, literature I have provided, might help in further detailing the issues which I have laid out in that course. Many thanks for your attention.